The high school season is just around the corner. How do we get prepared? One of the ways we do it is we look at plays, analyze all of the things so we can get better as basketball officials. Let's look at plays. Stick around. Welcome back to Five Play Friday, where we analyze all of the things. Without delay, let's take a look at play number one. All right, last year in a playoff game, let's do that. We had this out of bounds violation ruled a player voluntarily leaving the court during live play. The player, if we look, made a choice. I'm going to get to the, I'm going to run to the other side of the court. And in doing so, I'm going to run off of the court. And the official in this instance ruled this to be a violation, which is correct or was correct by rule. Of course, the fact that it was under 30 seconds in a three-point playoff game with the uh, loser going home added uh, uh, an interesting twist to the play. But this was the correct ruling by rule in high school in previous seasons. This rule has now changed. And when we get to a discussion about a player voluntarily leaving the court, this is the play that we're talking about. We're not talking about a situation where a player saves the ball and returns to the court and touches it because their momentum carried them off. We're not talking about that at all. This is a situation where a player voluntarily runs from one side of the court to the other and uses the out-of-bounds area to do so. This is now legal in high school for the coming season. So it's great to review this play to help us with that understanding. In the past, this was illegal. In the future, this will be legal as long as the player is not the first to touch the ball. We see on this play that the player, um, you know, the play is actually designed to go in the other direction. Play goes, uh, drives the lane, alights, passes to the wing, right? In this instance, in 2023-2024, this, in 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 this will be an illegal play. We see the confusion that results. Nobody knows what has happened here. It has to be explained to the coach, etc. Okay? So, this was illegal by rule, is now legal for 2023-24, But the key takeaway here is what we're looking at is a player voluntarily running off of the court. And that's what the new rules reference refers to, this now being legal. This is a legal action this year, starting this year, as long as the player does not is not the first to contact the ball upon returning to the court. But I have a feeling that we're going to get into a situation where officials overthink this new rule and try to apply it to momentum situations or throw-in situations, etc. During live play, player runs off of the court from one uh, point on the court to another. If they are not first to touch the ball, this will now be legal by rule in high school basketball. All right, that play clearly... Um, emphasizes the past, but I have another play very similar, and we can take something from that play as well.
All right. So uh, we have an illegal screen on this play, but mm, what I'd like to do is say, let's, let's ignore the illegal screen because this action by the player leaving the court voluntarily, returning to the court, and they are the first to touch the basketball. This would be, if we eliminate the, the fact that there was an illegal screen for not allowing a defender enough time to change speed and direction, um, this would be the play that is now a violation. A player leaves the court voluntarily, returns to the court, and is first to touch the basketball. And again, this is what this rule is addressing. Players running off of the court and then returning to the court. In this situation, a player gains advantage by doing so and is the first to touch, right? So we take, let's eliminate the illegal screen on this play and just recognize that what the new rule is emphasizing is this action. A player running off of the court, we, they may not then subsequently be the first to touch the basketball as occurs on this play. But that is exactly what the rule is addressing. Hey, you know we have a tremendous group of show supporters. Let's take a look at who's up on the big board today. Mark Skolnick, Kat Ryan, Tom Hickey, Gerald Mazzucci, and Thomas Hennion. Much appreciated and much love. You want to be a supporter of the show? I got great news. There's a link up above. Okay, we of course have a next play mentality here. Let's go. Let's go. Next play. That'll stop the clock with 3.34 to go. Matt McCallum looking to regain their composure real quick. And Lane, oh, gets a piece of it. He saw that one coming. A three by Booth. No good. And over the back on the rebound. That's going to go on Micah Kinevach. And let's see how many that. I've got him as four, but. And that's five on him. Kinevach. Now the second Tigagak player to foul out. Okay, rebounding foul ruled. Turns out that's the player's fifth foul. They're disqualified by rule. We're going to result in bonus free throws. This is an Alaska playoff game. Love the team names. They'd be a mouthful to pronounce. We have a double whistle on this play. Let's look at all of the things. Okay. That player goes to the floor, just an inadvertent uh, trip. We've got rebounding action. So we have a defender who has hands in the back, but these are just, this is just uh, spacing out, getting a feel for where the players are. Does the player in white displace the player in blue? That would be a question. I do not see obvious displacement on this play. I also don't see the, the lead having any sort of look on this play based on their angle, right? Should we have a double whistle in this instance? Right? Anytime, right? So for me personally, anytime that I have this body action, right? where the official is fooled and or is surprised by the, um, by the ball coming their way, it's because they're ball watching. If we were just officiating the players in our primary coverage here, this is what I see when I look at my game video. If we're officiating the players in our primary coverage area, we would not be surprised because we would see blue three step back to want the pass and their body body motion, their actions would say, hey, I'm about to receive the basketball. So when that player starts moving back, we would just step down. 
that's a clue for me. Um, but we have a double whistle on this play. Let's look at the actual rebounding action and see if we have displacement. Again, we have White place two hands on the opponent. This is not an illegal action. They are not preventing that opponent from moving. They're basically simply trying to create a sense of where they can establish their position on the court, right? So this action itself is not illegal action. And then both players dump. Does White move slightly forward? Possibly. Do they contact the basketball first? Yes. Is blue displaced? I would say no. I would say no. Um, so, but we have a double whistle. Let's take a look at our leads position here. Try goes up. They focus on their primary, the rebounding action. So there's definitely contact, right? But is there displacement? And the fact that one player is able to get the basketball because they can, they are taller and they can leap higher. Again, for me, if this was a disqualifying foul that I put in the game on a team down by five with three minutes to go in an elimination playoff game, I would not be happy about that. I don't, don't know that this lot rises to that level. That's me. That's me, right? Um, that's me. That's me. So you could certainly make the case, well, there was contact. But what we're looking for on rebounding, rebounding action is when players are allowed to compete and display their athleticism, etc. What we want to find is illegal contact. Displacement is illegal contact. Grabbing, holding, pushing, pulling, etc. These are all illegal actions. To me, on this play, we do not have something that rises to the level of a foul. Again, that's me. I have to trust, I have to trust my crew. My tech team has set me up. They say that if I press this button, good things will happen. So let's go. Next play. All right. I like this clip because it's end of game scenario. Of course, one of our points of emphasis this year is end of game scenarios, doing all of the things correctly at the end of the game. Um, this is a situation where we really have to be aware of time, score, strategy, etc. And there's some things about the play that jump off as well. First off, right here. Oh, 
let's go back. I describe this play as a tinderbox of so many things can go wrong here, right? So one of the things is these players who are at the... Uh, Here we go. These players here who are like their energy outside the three-point arc is uh, starting line. Like we're about to go in as soon as possible. And then we do have players leave before the ball. But we have a negative step. But the player is attempting to contact the ring. They are down by two points. They have one free throw remaining with 2.4 seconds. We need to be aware in this situation of all of the things, right? We know that the player is going to attempt to do this. Of course, we know by rule they have to contact the ring in this scenario. We, this, it's like even if, if they did contact the ring, this is a situation where is, the, is our timer going to start the clock properly when it's legally touched? They do a great job here of not starting the clock on this play. Right. So but prior to the play, are we going to talk to our timer and say, hey, right, we need to be great in this scenario. These players who are on the at the three point arc who are, you know, in a in a race position like they're going to enter as soon as possible. Have we addressed this situation previously in the game or on the first of the two free throws, reminding those players Etc. Easy to see we, how we could possibly have a violation by the defense here that would create a simultaneous violation situation. Um, but I really like all the actions of the crew here. Our, our uh, center officials in a great position, right? And they make the ruling, the correct ruling, very emphatically. They designate the spot, all of the things. Our trail official grants a timeout in the situation, but. What we have is a situation where end of game, in this exact moment, so many things can happen, right? The ball hits the ring, caroms high into the air. What if our clock starts, right? What are we going to do in that situation? It would be so messy, right? <clears throat> we have these players who are about to violate um, from beyond the arc. Have we addressed that? Have we tidied that up so that it's not a factor on this play? And in the end, our player violates by not contacting the ring. Oh, these plays make me very nervous. Very nervous, me personally. Uh, you know, because there's, like I say, there's so many things here that can go wrong. And when things can go wrong, oftentimes they will. So my counsel would be, <clears throat> in this situation, we have to talk to our timer. And we're just saying, we're just, you know, just like, uh, you know, major league players, each and every time there are two outs, there's one out, etc. Right? <clears throat> Is talk to our timer, make sure they will not act incorrectly, right? That they're really focused. Say, hey, if <clears throat> if he misses the try, I will chop in the clock. If it's successful, don't start until the ball is legally inbounded, etc. Right? Let's be really good here, etc. I'd want to clean these players up on the three-point line so that it just, be, just does not become a factor on the play here, right? That's what I have there on that. So it's a great play scenario just to end of game, looking at all the things. Yeah, that's, like, that's what we like to do. Because without delay, let's look at our very next play scenario. leading scorer tonight and a quick foul that one's going to be on Cleveland and that's the diving on the ball you like to see especially from Anna Claire Kepin she realizes how important this game is not only for her but for the entire team she's ready to give it her all I mean she possibly only has 6 minutes and 38 seconds left of her Bears basketball career the Bears aren't able to come back from 20 points down she's going to give it everything she has during these last few minutes so she's going to
All right, very near the start of the fourth period, we have a foul by Blue on White. Our official's in great position, does great things, designates the spot, etc. But let's look at all of the things on this play. Now, when it comes to team control fouls, when a team, when a player commits a player control foul, defenders standing under the, you know, in a defensive position, they are completely legal, they are blown up, they are displaced, easy, player control foul, we're going the other way. When we have a bad screen, oh, easy, team control foul, we're going the other way. But we have situations where the ball is loose, we can become disconnected from the fact that this is a team control foul by rule. Now, the game says there's no there's no team fouls on either or there's only a couple of team fouls. We're not shoot, we're not anywhere close to bonus. So do we really need to identify this as a team control foul? Yes, yes we do. We need to each and every time a team control foul is committed in the game, identify it as such because we'll get into situations later in games where there is a bonus situation. And we will have the game say, hey, we're going to go shoot free throws on this very play, right? So it's really critical that we do that. Now, in addition, of course, new this year, 2023, 2024, we have new throw-in spots. Does the, Where would this play be this year? How would we administer the throw-in? How are we going to determine that? Let's look at all the things. So first of all, on the play... Ball is deflected. Blue commits illegal contact. There had been no change of possession. That is a team control foul by rule. I'm going to do that. Let's go. Right. So if our illegal, illegal contact occurs here, this would be, in the past, this would be our throw-in spot, the spot nearest the foul. But since this is a front court foul and White will be awarded the ball in the front court, this year we will go to one of the four spots. And that would be approximately here at the 28-foot line in front of the White bench. Right, so we have that review. But we never get a recognition that this is a team control foul. And all I can say is identifying these each and every time because this is an unusual situation. The ball is loose, a foul occurs. There's a, it's not clear, like I say, with a player control foul or an illegal screen, which are very they happen a lot in the game, etc. We have to develop our skills in these these situations to identify these as team control fouls so that when the pressure is on in an end of game situation, we do not go and shoot bonus free throws in a playoff game that could have a major ramification. We don't want to do that. <laughs> All right. So a little play review, looking at team control foul there. Looking at throw-in spots, new this year, 2023. All right, we've had a review there of identifying team control fouls, and we mentioned the fact that why would we do that? Because when the game, the pressure in the game grows and it is a bonus situation, we may be inclined because the game is going to say, hey, let's go shoot bonus free throws. And we'll see that in our very next play. Ashlyn Copel working around the screen. Nothing inside working. Now Macy Copel with 10 on the shot clock. There's Nagel at the top of the key. That one inside tipped away by Wadsworth. And now a push from behind. See who this one is on. That's Emma Yost, I yeah. believe. And that's her fourth. That was a bad pass. And just Wagner on that offensive set. Their spacing wasn't good. They just seemed out of sorts. Wadsworth, four of six at the free throw line today. She's got 12 points. Toes the line. Some big free throws coming up here to try to push this to a two possession game.
Okay. All right. So here we're talking about that very situation. Two minutes to go. Tight playoff game. Team has just gone into the bonus. This is last year. So red has six fouls. Maybe we've just communicated as a crew. Hey, we're in the bonus down here, right? We may be in that situation this year with our sort of our focus on getting bonus right uh, as we adopt the five team five team fouls in a period, et cetera. It's going to take some getting used to. So the pressure is on. You know, there's a lot of the shot clock in this instance is running down. There's a lot of things going on for our officiating crew. Those, those two girls in the post are, uh, they both have some heft and they are both competing very physically. So this is a very interesting matchup. But in the end, we have red team control and that does not change. There is no change of team control on this play. This is a team control foul. We should not be shooting bonus free throws. Now, if we were in the business of identifying team control fouls for what they are in all instances, then we are going to get this play right. If we don't habitually do that, then we are potentially not going to get this play right. This is a crew mistake. Our crew needs to identify the fact that this there was no change possession. We should not be shooting bonus free throws. This is a big mistake. Huge stage, three-point game, two minutes to go, and we're erroneously attempting free throws. Now, obviously, this would be a correctable error scenario, Right, but the key thing here is we have to identify these situations. Is this is this a common situation, right? Such as an illegal screen, or is this more unique, right? This is sort of a, I call it sort of the twilight zone where there's it's not clear uh, if the ball is loose. There's a deflection, etc. To me, this is pretty obvious, <laughs> but we have to identify these situations as team control fouls each and every time. Because in this instance, the game says, oh, we're shooting free throws. The game is like a, a, a ship, a barge moving, right? It just wants to go to the other end. And we need somebody to step up and say, hey, wait, partner, did we have a change of possession? No, that's a team control foul, sideline throwing, right? We need to step up and have that awareness. But again, if our crew has just communicated, we're sort of on the, oh, I don't want to miss the fact that the next foul, next uh uh, foul results in bonus, right? And then again, the shot clock running down in this situation. So this is the ramification when we don't do that. And this is a crew mistake. We have to get these plays right by rule each and every time so that when the game is most important, we get it right as well. Hey, thanks for joining us on the show today. Much appreciated, much love. As always, allow us to thank our tremendous show supporters who make the show possible. Mark Skolnick, Kat Ryan, Thomas Hickey, Gerald Mazzucci, the Zooch, and Thomas Hennion. Much appreciated, much love. You could support the show. They'll put a link up above. I'll put a link in the show notes. We've got additional video content for you here. And here, make a choice, choose wisely. But any way you slice it, we are going to see you in the very next video. Take care, everybody.